Okay. Yeah. Did that work? Yeah. Perfect. Now close this. So the message in the slide is that in India you see some black dots in the distance, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's it is it is honestly I think my biggest trouble is because it's it's so incomparable. The two pelagics are so different. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, like I think in India there's still the charm of finding something new for the country. I think that's the biggest. Mm. Like you know, you you go through large periods of nothing. Yeah. Nothing's happening. There's never nothing happening in Pelagics here. There's mm -hmm. always birds around you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Like that, that. That's not a. The I have never been in a Pelagic where I'm seeing nothing but the ocean around me. <laughs> <laughs> Need to see but, that one day. Yeah, yeah. But it's so it's such a different like m mentality. Right. You know, in India, you're like, oh, there's a bird, and you everybody's excited about that bird. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. but but the but the excitement is there because you might see something that's mm. really there or hasn't been recorded for the country or something of that sort. Yeah, or, or, or some or some new pattern or phenomenon. La Can the I... last one there was almost nothing, but we saw some ten plus Persian shear waters every every ten minutes. There'd be a Persian shear water. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, I mean, because there's uh, not enough sampling in yeah, the yeah. waters, right? In general, so you don't know what the seasonality is. Uh, you don't know because some of these things pass for like two weeks, and yeah. then it's all gone. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, <laughs> there, Ramit. In India, and I'm hi, sir. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? We are good, thank you, Ramit. Good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Shiv Shankar as well. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yeah. No, should be. Yeah, I think if you visit, so, uh, it's a very it's worth worth doing a pelagic. There's no other reason to come other than to do a pelagic. Tasmania has a species list of like 300 birds, out of which 100 are pelagics. <laughs> Let me back magic, my God. I have one other reason to come. My my brother, my elder brother is in uh, Hobart in Tasmania. Oh really? Yeah, he's been asking me to you know to visit for a long time. Yeah, uh, yeah. Even the days before I got interested in birds, thanks to you. Yeah, no. Then uh, yeah, you should. Then you have uh, two reasons. I think uh, meeting your brother might be bigger than going for a. Where are you in Tasmania? Which part of Tasmania? I mean, I mean Devonport. So on the other side of, but, but Tasmania is tiny. Like it's I know. Not very, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the apple-shaped uh, island off the coast. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Very and so Hobart's Hobart is on the other side of Tasmania from me, but it takes two and a half, three hours to get there. Okay. Yeah. This is has it started warming up there. No, it's the opposite. No, so winter. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. our summer is so, your winter. Okay, start again. Yeah, so it, it snowed yesterday. So it's oh. just <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. It's sorry, I, the other way around. I'm just uh, excited uh, talking to Ramit because we're not started the session yet, but I'll, I'll keep quiet from this point onwards. <laughs> Over to the experts. <laughs> no, no, feel free. Um, yeah. Let me. Do we have any idea how deep the water is in the Mangaluru Pelagics? Let me go on. Mm. No idea. I think Shiva will have to answer. I was on mute. Okay, sorry. I was on mute and talking uh, 40 nautical Ramit from Mangalore. Yeah, but how how deep is the water? Oh, okay, that one. This is uh, where we go. Usually, it's about uh, twenty. What was that feet? Uh, twenty meter. Okay. Uh, I mean, the usual uh, distance that we uh, go from the Mangalore coast and the depth at that point. Yeah, yeah. On twenty-two meters. Yeah. Okay. 
not very deep at all. Because I was thinking, I mean, just just revisiting all of these things today, like the Chennai Philajics, they should get a lot because of this really yes. deep, sh- really deep shelf over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so close. Like Pondicherry, yeah. they should definitely do exactly. Philajics from Pondicherry or something. Exactly. It's really good. They do get, I mean, like, I think the few Pelagics over there, there have been more surprises at least, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And even they had some surprise, so they have stopped. A bigger surprise that made them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but actually, not just birds, but even like cetaceans and everything. Yeah. 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 You should get a lot. Wait for another minute and then uh, yeah. formally we will start. So sea watching season is starting now for you guys. Uh monsoon, no. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I guess no boats can go out, but time yeah. to time to just watch from the land, I guess. So yeah, that's uh that's the only opportunity, I mean no window that we have right. Uh, so, probably uh, if we go to uh, I mean probably we have to get in touch with all this deep sea. Fisherman and then see if somebody goes in, in monsoon correct. also. Correct. correct. I, I think just standing at a place like Malpe or something and looking will be will be good. But we don't do it, no. <laughs> yeah. Mm. But I, I actually think it's it's been quite productive anytime anybody's tried. Yeah, yeah. So I went and uh, so last no two July's back or three July's back at all, maybe three July's back. In Kerala, and, you did. No, the uh, southern Kerala coast. Yeah. And uh, just stood off the sea and there were like uh, hundreds of uh, share waters and uh, storm petrels and everything could just see off the coast. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Sri Lanka. Yeah. Mm. yeah Sri Lanka. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that distance is is remarkable, you know, from Merissa, I think. Mm. Matara, Merissa. Yeah. So this is what we need to look at. Huh? We need to tell everyone. Yeah. So this is what <laughs> this is what makes Tasmania really so the actually the entire east coast of Australia you'll notice that the shelf drops off. Okay. And it's really deep. So the waters we go to are about we start from a place here. Yeah. And we go out to here. Okay. And it goes from it goes to about 600 meters deep. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And that's where you want all the all the currents to bring all the nutrients up to the edge over here. Mm. And that's where everything that happens. And this is just 10 kilometers from the coast. Mm. No, no. About about 15. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi everyone. Yeah, it's time. Two minutes past six o'clock. Uh, we'll get started with the experience Ramit is going to share with us. As you all know, Ramit has a keen interest in several aspects of natural history and uh, is an alumnus of Manipal Institute of Technology. His interests have led him to pursue a career that keeps him amidst the nature. Over the years, he has worked and volunteered with uh, projects involving wildlife monitoring and surveys, as well as large projects that involve outreach, conservation, and dissemination of information. He's a passionate about the community engagement, nature, education, and science, citizen science. And he's also author of three editions of Birders Handbook to Manipal and uh, has authored Mandu Kawani. It's a acoustic guide to frog calls and has helped describe three new species of frogs. And uh, he was along with us 
uh, at least two or three uh, pelagics of Mangalore and Udupi coast, and he is very uh, much now. I think yeah, he is doing it more often uh, at uh, Tasmania. So we'd like to hear from him his experience with the compar comparative of uh, pelagic birding in India and as compared to Tasmania. Uh, over to you, Ramit. Thank, thanks for that, sir. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I came to, I think I took part in three pelagics, once in 2011, once since 2015, and another in 2016 uh, from Mangalore. And um, I think that 2011 was the first pelagic from there, I think that Shiva said organized. We went from Mulki, actually that one was from Mulki and then the other two were from Mangaluru. Um, and in 2018, I moved to Tasmania, which is uh, this little island off the southern tip of Australia. And it's actually, so there's about to give you an idea of how big pelagic birding is over here. Uh, out of the total state of Tasmania has about 300 species recorded and just over a hundred species out of those 300 are all pelagic birds. So birds you see when you get out onto the open seas. And it, in my opinion, and I think most people who visit here agree that it is arguably the best place in the world to see pelagic birds. Like you get more species, you get more numbers. Numbers, maybe New Zealand might be better, but in terms of species diversity alone, you get an incredible diversity of birds in Tasmania. Um, so this is, uh, I remember we used some, can everybody see my cursor? I'm not sure. Are, are cursors visible? Like my mouse yeah, cursor? Yes. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, I remember like we used um, on the 2015 trip, I think it was, uh, we used some oil, fish oil to create a slick. And there were lots of Wilson storm petrels that gathered this is in Mangaluru. In, in Tasmania, uh, they use this process called burling, which is they get fish and off the back of a boat, there's a man who breaks the fish down and it creates an oil slick behind the boat. So wherever you go, you have a, a, a bit of fish oil and you throw out pieces of chicken um, and that attracts all the birds in. So they get attracted to the smell of the fish and by sight, by seeing all the other birds around there. And then they feed on, on the fish, on the chicken that's been thrown out. So you get some, like in this photo here, there's three species of albatrosses in the slick. Um, so I'll just give you an idea of where all I'm talking about. So this is of course, um, India on the Western coast. And Mangaluru, this is where the pelagics go from in Mangaluru, out about, I think, 40 kilometers or something out to here, about here. Compare that to Tasmania, which is in the Southern Hemisphere. So go all the way down. The next landmass from Tasmania is literally Antarctica. And we go for pelagics here from a place called Eagle Hawk Neck over here. So you can, you can see Eagle Hawk Neck. And we go from this little jetty over here and we go out to the shelf edge past these islands called the Hippolytes to about here. So which is a very short trip actually. Um, so again, to give some idea, um, this from, from here to here to the shelf edge, which is where you want to be to see all the birds is about maybe 15 kilometers as a crow flies as such, but the boat takes a route that goes about 30 kilometers. Um, we go on a boat that's like this here. So that's the Pauletta that you can see. I'll actually remove this here. And I, at least the boats I've been on in Mangaluru, I don't know if they've changed with time, are a bit like this. So I actually found the Mangaluru boats to be a bit more comfortable they have an indoor section and everything, and it's quite nice with a lot of space for everyone. 
the the boat we use in Tasmania is actually really small. It can only accommodate twelve people at a time, and it's pretty crowded even then. Like not everybody will get to see the same bird. You you have to hope that the bird has to cross to the other side. Um, but the seas are very rough, so you need something that can handle those seas and can get really close to the birds. You can get within touching distance most of the times. So this is what I mean by the sea conditions being very rough. You have to sort of hold yourself upright. As you can, this is my friend Paul, um, who's you can see he's perpendicular to the ocean, to the surface, but the boat is boat rocks all the way, like goes forty five degrees, sixty degrees sometimes, um, side to side. So lots of seasickness. This is an idea of how it is. So those are all short tail shearwaters in the distance and around us is a big pod of common dolphins, maybe about a thousand dolphins or something. Wow. Yeah, sometimes just watching that video gives me yeah. seasickness. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so this is a pretty typical morning out of Tasmania. So in the waters are always very choppy. That's why you always get these photos. Oh, sorry. You always get these photos of really rough seas because, you know, and from Mangaluru, you know, you get used to all of these uh, clear, almost glassy waters sometimes. Um, but for the the seas are always choppy. Um, one of the things, of course, like I said, the species diversity. So about in India, if you count, let's say some of the terns and the Jaegers and the gulls, you get about 25 species is a maximum that you will probably regularly get occurring off the west coast of India. Um, in Tasmania, 65 to 75, you expect to record every year, at least, uh, species from the coast and this is not including a lot of other seabirds, like, your, you know, the, the cormorants that live at sea or a lot of your terns or your gulls and stuff like that, which lives off of the sea. Uh, this is truly pelagic species, which at least in Tasmania, they refer to as birds that you can only find once you get um, out to the continental shelf. So this is here a fairy prion, which is actually one of the few species that breeds in Tasmania. Um, and is one of the pelagic species. So what makes it so unique in species rich? So um, one of the reasons, so a lot of these birds rely on winds to carry them. A lot of the albatrosses, for example, can cover, you know, they can circumnavigate the Southern hemisphere pretty much, go from all the way around here and back to, so start from Tasmania, let's say, to go to New Zealand, fly across the Pacific to South America, across to the South Cape of, of Africa, Cape Horn, and come back to Tasmania. There have been some species that have been recorded to do that entire circumnavigation in about seven to eight days, um, which is just incredible. And they do that without landing. Then they do that while foraging. So there's not a direct flight. They'll forage from like, you know, different places, along different places, stop for a while, eat, and then continue on. But what helps them along their way is this unbroken band of winds called the Roaring Forties, Furious Fifties, and Screaming Sixties. So the Roaring Forties is what Tasmania comes under. So Tasmania is right in the path of Roaring Forties. So it's, and these are um, constant winds. So to give you an idea, in Tasmania, if you even go out to a forest, all the all the trees are bending to the east. Because over the years, all the, the, west, the westerlies, all the winds have made them bend over to one side. So there's no tree that leans to the west. All of them lean over to the east. It's a very easy way. If you get lost, you always know what direction to take. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, but so these birds, they all follow the, these, um, these wind patterns. And so when you are going on a pelagic, for example, if there's been, if these winds have died down, 
you often don't see a lot of birds so what ideally what you want is that for these winds to be going around for about 2 or 3 days which brings all the birds to the tasmanian waters and then keeps them there and sometimes you even want like a bit of the northerly winds to come down so there's some birds which have managed to rise up to the southern coast of australia and then come back to tasmania so often you can you can time these trips a bit but i'll come to that in a, in a short while the other uh, thing that makes it so species rich are the oceanic currents um so you can see this is tasmania over here this island oops sorry this island over here and we get these two currents here which is one is a this subtropical front that again follows the same direction as those westerlies and another thing called the tasman front which brings all the warm waters from the tropics so these are the tropics it brings the warm waters down along the east coast of australia to tasmania and then goes off to new zealand and these kind of meet over here which is where we go for the pelagic birding so you get all the summer species coming down from the tropics down here and you get antarctic species coming taking these currents and coming into tasmania over here there's slight overlaps in autumn and spring but you get these two distinct seasons where you know you can see frigate birds in the summer and then in the winter you see things like southern fulmars which is this species that breeds on the ice in antarctica mm. for example the other thing that uh, i don't know if you heard the conversation earlier we were talking about it was that the continental shelf is very close by so to give you an example so this is from the port at dakke in mangaluru where we go off and you go out to see and the, this is approximately the continental shelf although it's not very deep in itself but that alone is 90.18 90 kilometers let's say so that's a 90 kilometer journey if you are traveling straight out to see yeah from eagle hawk neck where we take the boat from it goes from a sheltered harbor it's less than 30 kilometers and you are in 600 meter deep waters and about 25 kilometers and you will be in for example 200 meter deep waters which is also pretty good and you want these you look for the continental shelf because of this these things here it's called upwellings and so what happens is that the colder nutrient rich water it comes up to the shelf then it gets because of the shelf it gets pushed out to the top and because the winds are always going to the west here the winds force the warm waters coming from inland out and replace them with the cold nutrient rich water which is exactly what you want so these nutrient rich waters come out to the phytoplankton over here the phytoplankton blue produce blossoms and the zooplankton that feed on the phytoplankton all the fish that feed on the phytoplankton all the krill and everything that birds eat or fish that birds eat everything then is found and concentrated on this continental shelf and so this is normally where we go out to it takes us about one and a half to two hours to get out to the shelf and what they do so uh, you know to compare to mangalore for example a pelagic from mangaluru you're almost always moving in mangaluru right you go out as far as you can um and then when you've gone out as far as you can you come back to port um on an eagle hawk neck pelagic you would go quickly you would quickly go out to the shelf you would start burling which is the process again where like i mentioned from the back of the boat you will throw out uh, chicken pieces in a in a in a slick made by fish oil and then you just wait and then you just wait for the birds to come sometimes sharks come first then the whales come and eventually all the birds start coming because they see all the commotion of what's happening and soon you will be surrounded by hundreds of birds um the other reason as you could tell was that uh, it's the last bit of land before antarctica and actually ashwin mentioned it in his talk earlier um that there's a lot of species that breed in the southern hemisphere and so because of tasmania's location 
it is within range of many species. This is something I got from biodiversitymapping.org. So it has species, uh, let's say up to 56 species being mapped for every grid. And you can see from compared to anywhere else in the world, New Zealand and Tasmania, this particular area has the highest diversity of species, even more than compared to, let's say, other places where people go see watching like the Galapagos or from the southern tip of, you know, uh, South America down to Antarctica, that area, even none of those areas are as rich or, you know, uh, the place where most documentaries are shot would be places like South Africa where the sardine run takes place. Mm -hmm. But even those are nowhere near as diverse as this particular region over here. And that's because, so there's this group of islands called the sub-Antarctic islands over here, as well as Tasmania and New Zealand. Together, they, these groups um, play host to about uh, 40 different species that breed here. And then multiple species from here, from here, visit these places um, across the seasons in different times of the year. So these islands will support breeding populations. So I already showed you the fairy prion earlier, which was this bird here. That, for example, oh, sorry. That breeds in Tasmania, this bird here, that's a fairy prion. And, but also uh, we have large colonies of Australasian gannets. So you have these islands with sheer cliffs. So cliffs with, with like rock faces here, like this, and you have species like Australasian gannets. You can actually see two albatrosses, but you have species like short-tailed shearwaters. So you get big numbers all around Tasmania in the summer. We actually, from my house around now, sometimes I can see juveniles which are fledgling right, which are fledging right now. They come up the river sometimes because they're confused about where to go. Um, but you can see them in big numbers all across Tasmania in the breeding season. They're actually Australia's most numerous bird. So about 5 million of these birds come to Tasmania in the summer. And you also get species like these shy albatrosses. So this is an albatross species and it's just so weird. So this is, we took a trip in January, 2021 to this island called Mewstone Island. Um, I'll give you an idea. Sorry. So to this island here called the Mewstone and you can see the, the sheer rock faces. Actually, even in this Google Maps image, you can make out all the white yeah. on this side of the island, which is the sheltered side of the island because the western, westerly winds hit here. So this is a sheltered part. And that's where all of these uh, white-capped albatrosses nest. So you get thousands and thousands of white-capped albatrosses. We counted about 14,000 albatrosses. And they nest on these sheer cliff faces and they're like starlings. There's so many of them, you know, they fly all, all around and everything. It's an in incredible experience. And of course you get species like penguins. Like, so this is a little penguin. This is also near our house, about maybe one kilometer away. And you get them all around Tasmania. But we also get other species like king penguins and royal penguins and southern rockhopper penguins that come here in the summer to, to, cause they have this process. They, they do this thing called a catastrophic molt, which is they lose all their feathers in one go and they can't swim at that time. So they look for these islands to take shelter. on. And another reason it's species rich, and I think India will get there um, is because it has a very strong pelagic birding community. So as I mentioned, uh, any serious birder in Tasmania, if you want to have a big list, <laughs> you have to be going out on pelagics uh, very often. So to, out of the 52 weeks in a year, uh, there will be pelagics running in 50 weeks, at least. Oh. Yeah, so almost every weekend, somebody will be going out on a pelagic trip from Tasmania, for example, alone. And from Australia in general, um, you know, because it has such a big coastline, so pelagic, pelagic birding is a big deal. Um, you will have, trips going out, at least four or five trips going out every single weekend um, across the country. So this is to give you an example of, uh, this is of course, after a trip, this must have been a good trip because everybody's very happy. <laughs> and uh, this is a regular, you're out bird watching um, 
on a trip like this, you can see a Cape petrel over here. And you see this rod over here. This is the rod that you beat the fish. So, you know, you take the fisherman, will give you some fish from the day before. You bring that fish, you keep that in a bucket, which you can see over here. And using this rod, you smash the pieces of that fish so that it leaves behind the oil and traces for these albatrosses and Cape petrels to follow. Um, but this is, I'll just give you a quick idea of how recent this is. Up until 2000, birders in Tasmania had to look for fishermen to take them out there. Very few people went out pelagic birding um, until pretty recently, right? And in the 2000s um, is when they started chartering this fishing boat, this one particular boat in Tasmania called the Pauletta. So this boat, uh, they started chartering and this now goes out every weekend. So in between 2000 and 2010 is when it became very regular. And they accumulated because they went out every weekend in really bad weather, really good weather, all sorts of weather, but made sure that they got a lot of data. Um, now their, their knowledge of when things are found and where is very complete. Um, also, what I realized is that a lot of the pelagic birders here, because they go out so often, they become really good at identifying species. Um, like earlier, you had to take photos and without photos, it was almost impossible to identify species. But now you take photos to identify which island an individual must be coming from. <laughs> um, so to give you an example, different same species of albatross may have different subspecies breeding on different islands. And they can tell you a species of albatross from really far away by just looking at the jizz of the bird. Uh, but they will tell you using photos, for example, which island uh, that particular population may be from and things like that. So mm -hmm. their, their knowledge levels for that reason has become very advanced as well. And they can tell, for example, in which week what to expect. And I'll come to that also. Okay, I'll show you. So this is a bar chart for the Eagle Hawk Neck Pelagic trip. And you can see apart from four weeks, an eBird is not terribly popular in Australia compared to India in a way. Not all birders use it. Almost all of the weeks are sampled across the year. So there's a really good idea of what to expect and when. And you can see it's a pretty big list for what is supposed to be only a pelagic trip list. Um, so the experience itself, um, I think I'll just mention, I think, uh, so in, I don't have, unfortunately, I've lost all my videos from my um, Indian pelagics, but um, one of the features of a pelagic in India and probably across the world, because you see so many memes about it, uh, is that, you know, you get these periods where you see zero birds and even when I was, when I visited elsewhere now where they do pelagics, you know, you, you wait for periods of activity. So you'll have maybe one or two hours where you don't see much, or you see only the same species again and again. And then you will see something else uh, after two hours and then so on and so forth for like a, a total of eight hours or whatever you're out at sea. Uh, similarly, um, you know, a species list, anything between four species to 10 species is a pretty decent list for the day. Um, and I think that's where, that's what I expected when I first came to Tasmania. And I think what took me by surprise was that there's always birds around. There's just so many birds around all the time. Um, you know, you start, it's almost weird to say, but you start taking albatrosses for granted because they just hang around all throughout the day with you or you start taking certain petrels and shear waters for granted. And, and you expect, you get, you know, people will often get disappointed if they see less than 20 species of pelagic birds. So it's, it's a very different kind of experience. Um, but in saying that the excitement of, of pelagics, no matter where you are in the world, is that it is one of those barriers, uh, which is, you know, sort of not bound by your usual, usual limits like habitat, or uh, location and things like that. You can always expect something different um, and anything can really happen. Um, like I'm, I'm looking forward to the time where I know in India, you will definitely get at some point a barouse petrel 
from Karnataka or or possibly an Arctic turn as it's going south or something like that. And it's the same in Tasmania. Um, last year they had, um, for example, a new addition to the list was this species called a Manx shearwater, which breeds around UK and Scandinavia. And somehow it managed to come down, uh, cross the Atlantic Ocean, come around South America and reach Tasmania. So that's one of the, I think, the very special things about about being out at sea is that anything can happen and you can really look forward to any species anywhere. And that's often what keeps you going. But in saying that, in Tasmania, you have these big congregations. So this, can you see the flat water here, the different color of the water? That is actually the slick. So that's where all the fish oil is. And that's where all of these albatrosses are gathering. And in the distance, you can see white chin petrels. Sorry. There. So there's a lot of white, white chin petrels. There's a few kelp gulls, which is a species of gull that also comes from South America. And you have these birds that keep around you all the time. And this is with a phone camera, by the way. That's a royal albatross. That is the largest albatross in the world, the southern royal albatross. And uh, I think that's what I'm trying to actually get a video of. <laughs> but yeah, so, oh, sorry. Um, and even at times when things are really slow, so this is us heading back to port after an afternoon out at sea. There's always birds around. So this is a big, this is a big group of short-tailed shearwaters just moving along the horizon. Yeah, so my only wish is I wish the seas weren't as choppy over here. Luckily, I don't get seasick, but we always have somebody or the other who gets seasick, which then makes some other people seasick and so on and so forth. But it's um, it's quite an amazing experience, I think. And that's probably the biggest difference I found between um, pelagics in India and pelagics here in Tasmania in particular. In all that, months? Sorry? In all months, is it? The seas rough. In all months, yeah. You... It's just the species that keep changing in all months, but um, you always have birds around you. And the, I think because Tasmania itself is host to so many breeding species of birds, uh, some birds of that species will always stay. So you get, um, you know, it's not, um, it's not uncommon to see 80 individuals of shy albatross 50 individuals of wandering albatross, 10 individuals of royal albatross um, in a single uh, trip, for example. And that is a major reason people come to Tasmania for bird watching. Even people from across Australia, this, the Tasmanian pelagics are really famous, really popular. You have to book in January for a trip in December. Ah. If, if, on, if on Facebook, somebody says, I'm organizing a trip, please send me an email to confirm your booking. If I see that post one hour late, that yeah. trip would have been full oh. <laughs> by then. <laughs> um, this is just some of the common albatrosses we see. Like this I can almost guarantee that 10 out of 12 months, you will see all of them in a single trip. So that's the Royal, Southern Royal Albatross, Northern Royal Albatross, Wandering Albatross, Shy Albatross. That's the one that breeds in Tasmania. Indian yellow nose albatross, which I really like because it has the name Indian in it. Plus, <laughs> normally you can see a nice yellow nose over here, but it actually breeds in the Indian Ocean and, and probably is one species to keep an eye out for um, in India, and especially maybe off the eastern coast. They have been recorded really far north, not very far north, uh, south from Sri Lanka, actually, um, on one of the trips. Um, but Buller's albatross, Salvin's albatross, which is a very range-restricted species, only one island in New Zealand where it breeds, um, and a Campbell albatross, which actually has a similar species called black-browed albatross, also found very commonly in Tasmania. Actually, I can, that's one of the albatrosses I can see watch from my place here. 
but um, that black browed albatross for example has been recorded in the uk a few times so that also obviously travels a fair bit north and i think is one to keep an eye out for in india at some point and it's not just the fact that there's these many species of albatrosses it's also just how close you can get these are all at with my 100 mm lens as a shy albatross wandering albatross buller's albatross and you can see the numbers um in these photos um i i particularly love this photo so this is a piece of chicken in the slick that this wandering albatross has picked up and a shy albatross so they have a very strict hierarchy the wandering albatross gets the first shot at everything and then the shy albatross although it's called shy it actually is the least shy of them all i don't know why it's called that um gets the next bite at the chicken and stuff like that there's some white chinda petrels and you can see in the background it's filled with short tail shear waters and you know that's something you see very commonly that within a single view you are seeing multiple species all the time i thought it's a rain drop uh, water drops on the lens oh no no yeah <laughs> so those are all <laughs> but that's a, i think there's another thing in in india which i i, I actually missed this but in india you can go in your shorts and your shirt out on a pelagic right. in uh, in tasmania you have to be dressed like this <laughs> in all year round you have to be dressed in really heavy rain gear because you keep getting splashed by the water um the waves are too strong um oops yep um so the albatross is of course sorry the albatross is of course are the largest species of bird the wandering albatross and the southern royal albatross actually these three uh depending on which literature you follow i think the wandering has the largest individual is a wandering albatross but the largest species on average is a southern royal but you also get this is a these are the regular uh storm petrels so this is a gray backed storm petrel which is the smallest species of, of seabird found in the world and that's a very common one here in tasmania that's our most common one over here and i always find it funny because they actually this species is very closely related to the wandering albatross so it's amazing this is literally the size maybe about less than a sparrow about 13 cm i think 12 cm and the most contemporary species the species found all across the world the wilson storm petrel which of course every we all in india are very familiar with everybody here keeps hoping for a swinhoe storm petrel one day but it hasn't happened <laughs> um this is another two species that i think i know in india we've had white faced storm petrel and it's only a matter of time from mangaluru before we get this one this is the black bellied storm petrel although the black belly is a very tiny patch here um but these are the four common ones in tasmania and i think at least three of these uh can be quite regular in india i think with as we understand their movements and patterns better but my favorite species or the my favorite group of birds um are the petrels and you get like a stunning diversity this is just a small pick of the petrels like you get so many different types of petrels you get like the the stunning ones like the southern fulmar and the cape petrel the giant petrel um but also rare ones like westland petrel gray petrel these two are quite rare there's white chin petrel which is quite common in the summer it has a tiny white chin um gray face petrel great wing petrel white headed petrel um but all different types of petrels in sheer waters that visit um and it's you know just they they are very different to the albatrosses they don't stick around they don't uh they are a bit more challenging they don't stay they come and visit have a look at what's available in the slick but they don't tend to stick around much they seem to um always do just flybys so you only get photos of them in flight you don't get photos of them sitting down uh too much hiding um, is a uh, easier on the in the field or you would need a uh, photographs you get used to it okay and i think this is i go out for a pelagic for example maybe now about 25 times a year um and in my first year i couldn't id anything i would wait for someone to shout the id or take photos lots of photos actually i i got into photography because of pelagic birds and um, 
you know before that people who know me will know that i would rarely ever carry a camera mm. forget photograph things um but i got into photography because I, it was impossible for me to id them otherwise so things like this great wing petrel and gray face petrel used to be the same species mm. um but once you get used to it once you do this again and again and again and again you start picking out species surprisingly fast like i i often surprise myself by how quickly you know like i can see a bird a kilo, like 500 meters to a kilometer outside and i know which one is likely to be hmm. um and that brings me to this aspect which is sea watching from tasmania so tasmania uh, i'll give you an example actually has sorry for this i should have kept this ready earlier but i didn't so you'll notice these cliffs so this is a gould petrel again a very rare petrel very beautiful but you'll notice that there are these cliffs in south tasmania so these cliffs are about 200 meters high mm-hmm. all of these cliffs so these are the cliffs you see over here and um, what it means is that if you have a scope and you're willing to walk you can do some fantastic sea watching from from the coast uh, so even if you're not going out much for example from about i live about uh, you know i'll give you an idea again i live about this is tasmania so this is where that eagle hawk neck trips go out from somewhere here and i live on the opposite side of the island so it's a drive for me unfortunately but i live in a place called devonport here but i can go to the lighthouse over here and just set up a scope and still see about four or five species of albatrosses some prions and things like that um if the if the winds are really strong because unfortunately where i live there is no continental shelf yeah. so i rely on the winds bringing on the birds across the strait between tasmania and australia to be able to see them but if you are in the south you get afforded beautiful opportunities to see birds from the shore in fact the, I, there's a couple of species that i've seen from the shore but i'm yet to see from the boat uh, so i'm hopefully <laughs> one of these days <laughs> i'll be able to do that but in saying that um and i think this is one way of getting really good at iding birds and um ashwin's here i remember we went we were supposed to do a pelagic from bengaluru once and he had visited he was in manipal at the time and the pelagic got cancelled i think because of bad weather and we went to malpe port uh, near manipal and we saw uh, an arctic skua or a parasitic jaeger mm. from malpe yeah. um but and for example when i was in manipal this would be the place he would go to in really bad weather and i remember with sanjay and vrinda once we went and we saw swinhoe storm petrel and uh white wilson storm petrel um i can see that parasitic and pomeranian jaeger have been recorded wilson storm petrel has actually been photographed this sandwich tern bradwell tern i know suti tern is regular probably in some seasons there's christmas island frigate bird mass booby but all of these species uh especially maybe things like flesh footed shear waters mm-hmm. or even persian shear waters uh, in this season just look for bad weather mm-hmm. which can bring the birds in shore and to see birds from far away like this and then to collaborate them with your experience of them uh, you know on a boat when you get to see them up close mm-hmm. is probably a great way of um of sort of learning how to id these birds by jizz and i think uh, when you start doing that then it becomes so much easier not only that the other thing um, i think i'll go back to this again very often um, the birds we see i was like i'll give you an example so i'm only showing my photos here i was like this mottled petrel but again really far away you can see from the top here mm-hmm. just by looking at it it's got that m mark Yeah. and similarly so if i had to look for another bird let's say an antarctic prion an antarctic prion also has an m mark 
like that. So from a distance, they can, if you are looking at just a field guide, you would think they are pretty much the same birds. But you, by, by seeing how they behave and things like that, you know, you get this wider picture of how they do the things they do, which photographs can't capture. Uh, you learn to ID so much uh, from, you know, how often it is flapping its wings, how close it is to the water. Some birds behave differently in windy conditions to non-windy conditions, how they bank, how they don't bank, stuff like that. And, and you get, you, you start becoming really good at it, but the only way to do it is by practice. And um, so I think, again, like, if I was to come back to India again, which I really hope I do for, for a long, long, long time, like uh, to settle in India again, uh, I would love to sort of see these pelagics go out very, very often. Um, and it's the only way to really capture certain patterns. So even for, uh, you know, these eagle hawk neck pelagic trips, you'll see certain birds, like especially Antarctic tern, we know now when to see them. And it, see, it seems like you see them pretty regularly in certain times. So this is a eBird bar chart and you can see that where it's not the smallest dot, it means that bird has been recorded multiple times in the same season. Um, and so certain birds seem to be only common in very, very short periods of time. So like white neck petrel, the time to see it in the last week of Jan or the first week of Feb. Um, and so similarly, like a lot of these birds have really specific times when they're really common. And then other than that, like these broad bill prion and salvin's prion, there's a particular season to go see them. So it's, uh, I think it's important to do consistent sampling over the, over the year. And of course, in the monsoon months when a boat can't go out, the only way to do it is by watching from the sea, which everyone can do. Uh, so I think that is something that definitely should be encouraged as much as possible, given how many birders we have yeah. uh, in Karnataka and Kerala and Tamil Nadu, especially, you know, all these places. But yeah, that's it. That's probably hopefully gives you a good idea of how different <laughs> the yeah. two places are. I'm happy to take questions. And I thought for everything else, it's probably easier for me to like use the internet as opposed to a random presentation, which just can't cover the whole, <laughs> uh, you know, the whole picture. And how many boats uh, go out from your place? From just the one. Oh, just you, one. <laughs> just the one that is regular, which is the Pauletta, okay. which is this one here. Uh -huh. I have only ever been on this boat. You okay. can, some people, because this boat gets full so often, you can charter. So one of the things which is very common, because so Australians love going out to the sea and they love fishing. Like every Australian child, it seems, has grown up with a fishing rod or something like that. So all of these boats are normally available for hire. And most people own boats, have their own boats. That's another very common thing, which is a, probably a rich and white person thing to do. But I guess and it's, it's one of those things, which is Australians have a very, very close affinity to the sea. Before they can own a car, some families will own a boat. And uh, so they... You can charter boats, but they're usually more expensive uh, than this hiring this boat out, which is a guy who is sort of now a friend of the bird watchers. He's, he's the, the, the owner of this boat now spots birds and will identify them for us also, for example. So there's only one boat in Tasmania that's regular, but you can always have the option of chartering. There's a question in chat. Yeah. Do you feel there are ranges based on the distance from the shore? Oh, definitely. Uh, sorry, I'll just see where chat is. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, when do you feel there are ranges based on distance from shore? Yeah, definitely. So it seems some birds are more strongly pelagic than others. I think, which is why I think from Mangalore also, maybe one option is A, spending enough time in Lakshwadeep. Actually, I'll show you this on a map. It's much easier to understand. I think one of the things... Rami, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Hi, Kunan. Yeah, Rami, this Kunan here. Hi, Kunan. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Good, so, good. in fact, why I was asking was that we have made somewhere around uh, five pelagic trips from uh, Gujarat coast. Correct. And uh, usually we find that, you, you know, if you see the continental shelf, 
right uh, from gujarat it is at quite a distance so Correct. we tried at one point of time we tried to reach the continental shelf unfortunately we didn't find the bird but our experience very limited though but it shows that the birds they have a particular range from the shore so uh, the mass boobies usually would be closer to the shore wilson storm petrels would be at a farther distance correct so i think it has to do with again feeding methods right so i can only speak from my experience in mangaluru for example um you are more likely to find yegers or skuas um close to shore and i think that is because they rely on um stealing from other gulls and and things and they gulls and terns will often rely on fishermen being around them and so i think all of these things might affect why they go to shore similarly mass boobies um mass boobies should be diving for fish so they probably require shallower waters in that sense and may not be after krill and and zooplankton or smaller feeding things right so for example to uh, to give an idea um uh, you will notice so this is the eagle hawk neck pelagic trip uh, we there is a species called australian gannet which is a very close relative of um of the boobies we find this in shore so in shore being not on the pelagic shelf but this one goes diving um into the ocean for fish and it seems that is something that's maybe is just not a possibility of shore i'm not really sure why um but yeah i think boobies and gannets in general seem to be more uh, of an inshore species which was my experience in scotland and england also as well as with another species we get here regularly which is brown booby you get those inshore as opposed to offshore but it seems most species uh, which are tube noses so tube noses being birds which have this nostril here or like a tube like nose like these petrels yes, over here they seem to be very strongly pelagic okay so i think i think to see something like a huanin's uh, juanin's petrel or a bulwer's petrel or a barao's petrel i think you will have to go closer to the shelf than than be in sure and uh, is it that they uh, you have to cross the shelf or uh, probably in the nearby waters yeah so we find that if you go too far out from the shelf the bird diversity starts reducing again it is exactly on the shelf edge that the highest the bird edge. diversity seems to be there and that has to do with the upwelling i mentioned earlier so this this pattern here because where the shelf is is where the nutrients get pushed up right and so the okay. nutrients remain around here so this okay. is what we normally do is we'll get to this part of the water okay and you know the birds aren't there straight away they're there in the distance you can see them in the distance but they're not near the boat and this is where we start doing the burling or the you know where you create the fish fish oil slick so you start creating the fish oil slick that brings other species over here starts creating ripples all around the water um and you know other sea birds get attracted to that slick Okay can I have one more question Yeah yeah please please Okay so in fact we also tried the uh, the fish oil and the fish chum mm -hmm. uh it was really bad experience but uh, yeah uh, somehow other we are uh, it smells so bad so somehow other uh, we could not get the birds not even the girls is there any particular method to uh, uh, spray the chum or or just how so, do you in in this case from at least i know in different pelagic trips in australia they do different things but in tasmania at least what they do is they'll bring let's say tuna or something and they'll cut it up in pieces they put it in put it in a bucket uh with nothing but water right okay. and then they using an apparatus i don't know what it's a very basic apparatus it's like it's like a hammer it's this this rod attached to like a like a crush, like a hammer like a hammer head no in fact we did create the chum the, correct it's the same the same thing because those are available on internet so we we saw from the internet and we created the chum right. uh, probably we are missing out on something how to spread it uh, in the ocean and whether to uh, wait there after uh, for how long should we wait there 
that that is uh, where somewhere we are missing so i think what i can do is okay actually so this weekend i'm going on a pelagic again and we have a few people from queensland who are coming and that's where waters are just like in india you know like like glass okay <laughs> so in in tasmania because our waters are so choppy are when you start creating the chum when you start chumming essentially you get like 2 km long slicks like a really really long slicks okay um, so you can you can see birds like like there's a queue forming of birds essentially okay. but okay. i'll see i'll ask them actually what they do so if you can send me a text or something maybe in, no i'll i'll after. be in touch with you for this yeah yeah so i'm on a pelagic on the 14th and 15th of may i'll remember to ask what they do in queensland to create a longer slick for example okay yeah. I, i'll i'll get keep in touch with you thank you so much no worries my experience yeah. here in bangalore so far uh, we tried several times that oil uh, the only time that uh, it was in the month of april uh, where we were successful and a particular type of oil which we still uh, are not able to figure out which oil we took it and i mean even now they when we go and buy the fish oil from the uh, factory they they don't mention uh, the uh, which fish it is from so mm. it's a uh, still a mystery and it's only one time we were very successful and that, i think dramit what you have is that is from that trip right yeah and usually uh, that's right the, this storm petrol trip i yeah. remember yeah. the other thing uh, i we realized is birds go away if it's just fish oil mm. they seem to get the message very quickly that there's nothing to eat right. and then they leave so that's why we get the chicken mm. so you can see this albatross here is holding a chicken a piece of chicken so you you entice them with the fish oil but fish is too <laughs> precious to throw out <laughs> and they can be very fussy about what fish to eat so again i'll find out what species of fish we normally use mm. but it must be some local fish because they're local fishermen and um, and then you throw out the chicken pieces and so they they keep coming back to eat do something they, do they take the chicken uh, chicken for yeah, the Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, they love it. Okay. It's just the raw boiled chicken or the so, raw chicken. chicken. Plus, can I say actually? I think it's raw and boiled. I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I suppose another difference is that this will only work when there are large densities of uh, tube noses, especially Correct. around, right? Correct. And Correct. in our seas, we have to wait till April, end April, maybe uh, going on from end April till September. october as a time when this will actually work when there are really big numbers around or or yeah. quite possibly looking for i mean see one thing in tasmania also is depending on the time of the year you always have a species of whale that is migrating through so right now in the winter is southern right whale in the summer is humpback whale late summer is pilot whales and orcas mm. so the whale whales are often the first species to come close to something like this where there's a feeding frenzy so maybe these things need to be timed also with what the cetaceans are doing you know trying to figure out if there's some pattern that can be worked out and you know because before we start seeing birds we almost always start seeing mako sharks and the whales come to the surface mm. um like no. that's always a good indicator that that we have little control over <laughs> yeah yeah but it's yeah. you know always worth getting in touch with sort of you know the fishermen who see these things regularly to see what seasons this might work out on you know um cuz i mean a lot of uh, a lot of these birds are actually called whale birds because they follow whales around for oh. example okay so it's there's a chance there's a chance i'm not sure but i know like probably worth maybe even checking with people in sri lanka if they see a correlation with the blue whales over there and you know because those colonies are so well monitored we we'll find out uh, yeah yeah i have, I have I one more question yeah yeah why, why do we uh, why do we never see frigid birds in our pelagics is that is it that they're all off the shelf uh yeah so frigid birds seem to be a a, a rare phenomena even in <laughs> even in tasmania but when you do see them you see them from the shore and they do get them so they breed on the reefs in in queensland so in the great barrier reef so islands so technically they're breeding offshore maybe sometimes 90 100 kilometers offshore um but they seem to be feeding 
again they are a bird that relies on chasing other birds for food and so it's quite possible that because they're not hunting um you know they they're probably more reliant on just uh, other birds that catch things so like gulls and terns which are more common in shore than offshore it's quite possible mm-hmm. yeah but but frigate birds even in in india which i haven't seen yet personally in india but uh, seem to be you know more more of a monsoon bird for example so probably again require more winds and and things like that when boats can't necessarily get out much which is probably and when when we go out is when weather is so good <laughs> so they may be really really far off and and i think that's one thing again worth looking at is is can we get people in boats who go out in crap weather basically <laughs> and people who who are able to risk that might might benefit in terms of more sightings mm mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I mean, how, how many participants usually you have in the boat? How big is 12. it? Twelve. So uh, it's capped at capped at twelve, and during COVID, it was capped at nine. <laughs> uh, yeah. So not not much of a difference, but it's a it's a very small boat. At any point of time, only ten people can sit down. <laughs> so two always have to keep standing. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah i see you on your boat is quite luxurious when you when you travel off the coast of gujarat it is usually the fisherman's boat so uh, that's another challenge to have more people on the boat probably yeah um look so i one of the things i loved with the indian boats was that you could stand on the bow of the boat and watch look ahead mm. on these boats you have to be behind you can't come across to the front and i mean that would be stupid also because the waves are so high you'll yeah. never get a chance to do anything so you stand at the back which is where the slick is but it's a very small boat and by like uh you know i mean i guess it's it's the difference in in maybe standards of what fishing boats are here versus in india mm-hmm. to some extent um but i found the the mangaluru boats to be very spacious like you could walk around <laughs> for example if if i'm not wrong today they are even more spacious yeah uh, <clears> even <throat> more luxurious yeah. <laughs> yeah in that there's a big there's a lot of fishing net many tons of fishing net to sit on a very soft base yeah if you're feeling tired <laughs> so oh yeah perfect yeah so none of none of that unfortunately and you know you're getting smashed by waves it's yeah. very uncomfortable actually i think uh, ask uh, so saurabh uh, savant and uh, chetna sharma were here once and they went on a pelagic and they were completely drenched <laughs> by the end of it it it's uh, yeah it's very it's not comfortable that way you can't come back and expect to be dry i stop i have this thing called after 1 pm i don't see i tell everybody i can't see birds because my glasses are too wet by then to be seeing anything <laughs> regularly <laughs> or easily <laughs> So you go along the shelf edge, and then we uh, just drift. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we get to the shelf, and then we just start drifting. Mm. If not much is happening, um, then we go to another spot slightly deeper. Again, we then look for other signs, like where the tuna is, or you know, see what other fishermen can tell us on the radio where all the activity is happening, and we can change that. Yeah, change our locations. But normally, we start at seven thirty. in the morning 9:30 you're on the shelf edge 9:30 to maybe about 11 you will drift at one spot then 11 to 1 at another spot and then 1 o'clock you go back and 3 o'clock you're back on shore yeah 7 to 3 yeah so 7:30 to 3 o'clock something like that yeah earlier in the summer and later in the i mean in winter the sun rises at 7 7:30 anyway so later then yeah um any more questions yeah. again uh if you want to know more i just feel uh, i encourage you to just go have a look on the on the hotspot and ebird now that it's getting more and more regular for people to post over there but uh, uh yeah i i suspect uh again just i think it's in in india it's just a matter of effort 
it, it obviously you can't get the same diversity and things but it'll be so interesting to know if people go out more often how much there actually is you know until then this is hard to say so hard to say yeah yeah that shelf edge is quite far for us i mean at least uh, considering the available boats the fast speed at it which can travel uh, yeah uh, maybe a overnight one we may have to plan and then stay there and get to the shelf edge yeah That's so in and then, uh, yeah. i'll give you a quick idea of so in queensland you'll see that the shelf edge goes out again almost like india mm. and what they do over here is they do overnight trips mm. sometimes two or three days and they go out to these these are called sea mounts okay so essentially so from brisbane they go out take almost a full day to go out to these mountains in the sea mm. and then they'll just spend a full day just going around here because this is where all the upwellings are happening for them Mm. and this is where all the action is in in the tropical waters so maybe in india we just need to check where yeah. these sea mounts can be i can see that there are a few near to lakshadweep you know, for example i can see these are the lakshadweep islands of course but even even these mounts here okay you know all of these might be where this here for example of kannur seems to be really good mm. but this may be where all the birds are hanging around unfortunately i can't see much around gujarat but i think the <laughs> the shelf is much closer in gujarat then it is uh, the yeah. shelf is closer but unfortunately if you see that edge where your cursor was in yeah. fact there is a diet no a, a little uh, above it yeah exactly that part but there what happens is that when we measured the depth at one point it was 100 meters and then at the very next moment it goes down straight away to 1000 meters okay best yeah but that's perfect yeah that's exactly how it should be I think just more more sampling effort, man. That's it. Like even oh, these formations, which is unfortunately in Pakistan, <laughs> like yeah, that's why it becomes difficult for us to make because yeah, the yeah. problem is that the no government department grants permission. So whenever yeah. you make a pelagic trip, you are always under a threat of being caught by either navy or coast guards. Mm. I can imagine. I can imagine because <laughs> that's. But those again, those are other formations to look for. So in Western Australia. they do these trips they don't do they don't look for shelf edges they look for these canyons mm-hmm. okay so you get these canyons where everything gets funneled up but again they have a really incredibly large diversity of cetaceans so they then look for these canyons so from, from birth and they do these trips they do these trips into the canyons and that's where they look for all the pelagic birds here and stuff like that so that probably that canyon uh, on gujarat coast would be a more promising place possibly that looks a bit dicey for me in terms of security reasons <laughs> but yeah no, maybe we have been like accustomed this. now to all these uh, adventures yeah yeah <laughs> so we hop on to fisherman's boat take the risk and yeah in look, fact I we are planning to... a trip in late april uh, yeah i won't look i won't encourage this on a public forum <laughs> anyway. no, no of course not this is just the uh, security yeah, yeah uh, of yeah, course yeah. no um yeah so i think you have to look for these features around where you are and i understand like often it might take i don't know maybe even 10 trips you know before you actually find something mm. that's worth while of doing again and again but you know things like these sea mounts over here they they might be really interesting yeah. like from goa all of these places mm. here mm. yeah a bit more in depth research on these things overnight from time. bangalore next time Yeah. yeah. Mm. On those comfortable luxurious boats with yes. gym nets and things. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you so much. If there's anything else, I'm happy to answer. But thank you, Ramit. Yeah, it was very, very informative and in, yeah, the comparative uh, features and then the what we can do from our coast. And, yeah. yeah. It was very useful. Yeah. Um, good luck for all of that. And of course, if any of you are ever in Tasmania, uh, feel free to to let me know. Uh, you have accommodation sorted, and we'll definitely get a sort out a pelagic also. So yeah. <laughs> But to let you know many months in advance, no? Uh, yeah. No, no. I can. We can always arrange a pelagic. If you're on holidays, then it doesn't have to be a weekend. See. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, we are planning one on fourteen, but unfortunately, we don't have many participants. So, I mean, at least the minimum number. Yeah. Let's yeah. See. Hopefully, we will do. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the advantages here is that minimum number is also very small, so they mm -hmm. never have that problem. But of course, then you you pay on the basis of you know the fixed the the boat is a fixed cost, so everybody has to pay more if they can't get a minimum number. That's how it works out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Damit.